This is an extract from a short story called The Painter and the Dibbuk, the Dibbuk being, in Jewish folklore, the wandering soul of a dead person that enters the body of a living person and controls his or her behaviour. He was as nervous as I the night of our first sitting. He could not decide how to sit. He put his hands straight down at his sides, placed them on his knees, then clasped them in his lap. He folded his arms across his chest, but no, this would cover the medals that would surely come, the ones he told me I, or someone else, would add later as required. The arms returned to his side. His face held an expression he must have thought suitably military. In truth, on one so young, it looked comical. I have always subscribed to Benini's notion that the essence of the face can be seen only when it is animated. I could not initiate a conversation. It was prohibited. Yet if he did not speak, there was nothing to draw. The canvas displayed but a ghost in outline, a staggered arc for the shoulders, an oval for the face, arm and eyes. I clutched the pencil he had given me, poised. I waited. I waited. Can I hold my gun, he asked. Two slight vertical lines appeared between his eyebrows. I began sketching, if you wish. You will paint it. I will paint whatever you ask. He removed the pistol from its leather sheath, moved it from hand to hand. He placed one hand over the other and pointed it at me. Do you think about death, Altinum? I try not to. Ha, huh, it is a good answer. He drew the pistol towards his chest, then placed it back in the holder. It may be too much. Too much? It was a risk to ask a direct question, but I had to keep him talking. Mother knows I have not used it yet. She made me promise to tell her. You have not shot that gun. The words sounded strange in my mouth, an uneasy fit. No, they will not let me, but they will, they tell me, and soon. He lifted his chin. His nose was exquisite. I'm going to be a hero, he said. You would do well to make it a good picture. When they let me shoot my gun, I'm going to be a hero, and they will hang your painting in a gallery. Think of that. I thought of that. When the first session was finished, he came to assess the results. He stood for a long time. My nose, it is too big, he said. Make it smaller. Smaller? Smaller. His voice was crisp, chilled as the winter mornings. Though my fingers ached, Hashim helped me. I made it smaller. The left ear also. It is not the same size as the right. The left ear was not meant to be the same size as the right, for I'd angled his face to look slightly to the painting's edge. I could not draw those eyes staring straight into mine. A cool slick of sweat gathered on my brow. I enlarged the ear as requested. My eyes, bigger. The light bulb dimmed, flickered, then surged back to life. The air became thick with a stench like stale breath and gone off milk. My eyes felt the sting of the smoke from the chimneys carried in through the open doorway. I sketched and re-sketched, each time getting further from his true face. On and on the little corrections came, the hair, the eyelids, the lips. He convinced that at any moment the picture he wanted would appear the one I could not see. Finally, tiredly, he seemed to admit defeat, and then, here, you missed a part. Triumphantly, he pointed to the base of his neck, then the picture. I catch out the so-called great artists, you know. You miss nothing from now, Irkopf, understand? <coughs> Irkopf was a term I had heard used often. It meant egghead, intellectual, and carried the dangerous connotation of physical weakness. Yes, sir. I inserted the missing piece, the thin strip, where his white shirt collar flashed briefly above the neckline of his dull green overjacket, I knew I had run into trouble, for white was not to be found in this place. This was when you stirred inside me, an aching in my stomach. At first, I thought it was hunger. In the weeks that followed, I assembled my palette, enlisting the help of Dietmar and Lance, long-term prisoners, outing them like me. The deal was simple. The guard paid for my artistic endeavors with an extra ration of bread each day, Half of this was awarded to my helpers when a new colour was found. Whoever found white would receive the whole day's ration. We three served in the Sonder Commando, responsible for pulling the new inmates from the trains. We strode through the <coughs> confused crowds, confiscating suitcases, boxes and handbags, barking instructions to the crowd in Yiddish. The guards believed we were relaying their orders, and so we were, but also, tell the guards you're 18, tell them you have a trade. They looked at us, bewildered, failing to understand that we were saving their lives. To these words, we added, red, purple, blue is forbidden here. Give that to me. Scarves, hats, gloves were handed over and pocketed, smuggled back to the barracks. As we saw the people come into the camp, so we saw them leave. On such occasions, our job was to collect the clothes before <coughs> and move the bodies after. What we could salvage, we kept. We squeezed dyes from these pilfered clothes. We crushed onion skins to powder and boiled them down in the kitchens. We strained the juice from vegetables and scraped the rust from basin pipes 
ignoring the throbbing pain as nails wore down to the quick. We mixed stolen colours to pastes using oil, water, whatever we could get into our hands, but we did not, could not find white. I crushed maggots, rocks, fingernails, but all came out yellow. Bones are white, Dietmar told me once, extracting a gold tooth from the mouth, but only when first stripped from the skin. Thank you.